Samuel chapter 16. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, <laughs> Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel. So if you learn in your books of the Bible, that's uh, not too far to get to there. 1 Samuel chapter 16. Let me encourage you, if you don't know your books of the Bible by heart, or if you need to brush up on it, just, just uh, uh, the exercise of it will be good for your mind. Anytime you learn or memorize, it just be good for you. And so many folks learned when they were a child and they've always known, but many folks got saved when they were an adult and they've never known. And so I'd encourage you to be able to look up verses in the Bible and remember those. It's an important, uh, important help. And then the second thing I'd encourage you about is getting yourself a solid overview of the Word of God. By that, what I mean is when a book of the Bible is mentioned, if you think, I wonder what's in that book, well, then you don't have a good overview of it. You ought to be able to say that 1 Samuel really covers the transition between the period of the judges and the kings, for instance. And so that's the way we're preaching through 1 Samuel right now. If you don't have an overview like that, maybe you could just pencil it in, right in the heading in your Bible. Now there are some folks that uh, don't believe in writing in their copies of the Scripture because they misunderstand the difference between the eternal Word of God and uh, the print which the Word of God is in. And so if that bothers you, that's all right. You don't have to write in it. So then I require you to memorize the thing and not to forget it. So, Or you could write it on a piece of paper and slip it in your Bible, which would be the identical same thing, but might make you feel better about yourself when you do it. And so, 1 Samuel chapter 16, and we're going to read... Uh, verses 1 all the way up until we come to verse 7. And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil, and go, I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hear it, he'll kill me. And the Lord said, Take an heifer with thee, and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord, and call Jesse to the sacrifice. And I'll show thee what thou shalt do, and thou shalt anoint unto me him whom I name unto thee. And Samuel did that which the Lord spake, and came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming, and said, Comest thou peaceably? And he said, Peaceably, I am come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourselves, and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and called them to the sacrifice. And it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. Verse 7, But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. We'll pray. Father, please help us this evening to understand the vision that you have and the vision that we have and God how to respond as a result. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now the message I'm going to preach this evening, I hope you've heard me preach before. Uh, sometimes as a preacher, you know, we, we want to always be fresh, right? We always want to preach something uh, that's new or at least has some things or a perspective to it that makes an old thing uh, at least fresh or uh, makes you ponder or consider from another angle. Sometimes there's many ways to come about the truth. I have a pastor friend who is very near and very dear, and I have discovered that most of the time we agree on the truth, but oftentimes he just comes at it from an oftentimes a really unconventional angle. And his angle is usually a good one. It's a fine one. It just usually isn't the simple one. Uh, by simple, I mean it's, it's not the common sense one. I'm not saying he doesn't have... Well, I am saying he doesn't have common sense. Okay? But uh, common sense is good. But sometimes it's good to consider several reasons why a thing ought to be so or may be so. There's a lot of problem doctrinally with believers not allowing, looking to Jesus, looking to the cross of Christ, to be the simple means for salvation. There's a lot of problem with believers adding things or requirements to the gospel. And 
In 1 Samuel chapter 16, we get a perspective, a different perspective on why that's a problem. Because I don't have a problem with a lot of things that people would say. And by the way, I'll just say what uh, I'll just say with what maybe perhaps the gospel tracts would say. You could show me uh, at the end or the conclusion of the average gospel tract. You could show me the prayer that the author of the tract wants a lost person to pray. I don't call it the sinner's prayer. Uh, some people do. But to the prayer you want people to pray in the words of the prayer. And generally speaking, there is usually more in the prayer than is required for the gospel. And, and the problem with that is that no two gospel tract authors, and oftentimes the same author writing more than one gospel tract, they don't agree on what ought to be prayed or what ought to be asked for. And there's a disagreement, there's argument about it. Some of it comes down to doctrine. Some of it comes down to teaching. And when it comes to doctrine, when it comes to teaching, God has an opinion about it. It isn't as though we can pick an opinion. And so, uh, on the surface, if you'll say something to me like, Pastor, uh, you know, I told somebody that they needed to repent of their sins and trust Jesus as their Savior. On the surface, I'm okay with that. But doctrinally, I'm not. You understand what I'm saying here this evening? In other words, go ahead and repent of your sins if you like to. But trusting Jesus as your Savior is what will save you. You're being repentant about something. God doesn't forgive you for repenting. God forgives you because He judged His Son in your place. And when you receive Jesus, you receive the death of Christ in your place. Amen. And so repentance involves looking to Jesus. In other words, it goes from repentance is going from not looking to Jesus to looking to Jesus. And the gospel's as simple as that. And if you don't believe it's so, then rebuke Jesus because He's the one that said it was that simple. And I know many people that would rebuke Jesus about saying the gospel's that simple. Okay, now when it comes to that, almost everyone would, would agree with me as far as anybody who believes the Bible and it believes it's the authoritative Word of God. Now they would say, well, Pastor, I would say it differently. I'd put it this way or I'd put it that way. Most people, most believers would agree with me about that. Or at least you'd agree that if I receive Jesus that way, you'd at least agree I'm saved. It's interesting how many people say, you can't be saved that way, but won't tell anybody they're lost by the way they receive Jesus. Uh, but at least you'd agree I'm saved, wouldn't you? Well, Pastor, you know, you've got to see some fruit in their life. Well, that just isn't the gospel. That's all. Go ahead and look for fruit in a believer's life. But that just isn't the gospel. That's all. And uh, believers want to go down that road. And I'll be honest with you, when you make statements like, well, you know, he says he's saved, but... You know what I'm talking about? He, he says he's saved, but I don't see... You know, and maybe maybe you, you've rejected the buzzwords and come up with a different way of saying the same heresy. But uh, you know, he says he's saved, but I don't see any fruit in his life. Well, the Bible never says you have to see fruit in somebody's life to believe they're saved. Or he says he's saved, but I don't believe him. I hope he gets over it. <laughs> you ever had somebody not believe you? It hurts a little bit, but I hope you get over it because your salvation isn't dependent on any person believing it. But our text this evening helps us to understand how God views it. Years ago, I realized that people can deceive me. And you may think you're so sagacious. I said that wrong. Is it sagacious? Saga how do you, sagacious, right? Uh, when you're a sage individual and you, you're wise. You might think you're so wise and so discerning that people can't trick you. And truly, experience does give you a little bit of... Um, a little bit of... intuition, I guess you could say, when people are being tricky. And it's almost a certain thing when somebody tries to convince me what a wonderful Christian they are, that they're hiding something. Or that they want me to think that so that I won't think the actual truth. Now... I don't go around looking for that. Uh, I've just found that the best policy in general, generally speaking, is to just take people at their word. 
If a person understands that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He came to this earth to die for sinners, that He was crucified on the cross without ever having sinned Himself, and became sin for every person who had placed their faith in Him, and you've placed your faith in Him, or you tell me you have, I believe you. Even if you're a lousy individual. Because you didn't get saved for being a good individual. You got saved from being a lousy individual. And even if you're still pretty lousy, I believe you. In other words, if somebody tells me, I got saved because I was driving in a thunderstorm and I thought I was going to run into the ditch and I cried out, God saved me, and I didn't run into the ditch, and so I'm saved. Well, that's not the gospel. And so you're not saved. You may not agree on it, but I, that's my judgment, okay? My judgment is that if you believe something other than the gospel, you're not saved. But if you tell me you've believed the gospel and received Jesus as your Savior, even if there's sin in your life, or even if I have cause to question your relationship with God, I don't suspect you're lost. Listen to me, would you please, Christian? You go down that road and you will do... You, you, you think you're so pious and you are serving God so well by evaluating people's lives and if you go down that road you'll do so much harm to the cause of Christ and you will hinder somebody from having spiritual victory so badly because of your terrible misdiagnosis and it's actually wicked Amen, preacher. that's it it's just wicked and that's a fact Man, I grew up, and I know believers today who grew up under the kind of preaching that questioned the sincerity of somebody's salvation so much that any time there was a matter of victory, that is, a person is struggling with sin, then it was always a matter of, I don't know whether you're saved or not. And those people today are so far away from God and so bitter against God, and I'll be honest with you, it's more of their response to bad theology than it is to their own bad relationship with God. And every person answers to God for themselves. Don't imitate me, Caleb. All right. <laughs> Caleb's doing preacher motions back here. <laughs> That's great. Uh, he can imitate me. I'm just kidding. This is funny. Wish y'all had seen it. He's like... <laughs> All right. But many individuals have done great harm to other believers and discouraged them. I knew individuals that prayed summer after summer the same prayer, well, you know what, I don't know if I really meant it or not, and so I prayed to be saved, and they, they confessed their sins and repented and came to Jesus, and then they struggled with the same sin later on, and they thought that God didn't save them well enough to have victory. <clears throat> so the problem then became God's ability to save them, or their ability to believe God saved them, and uh, the problem with all that is that anyone that calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's a shall promise. And the problem with it is that God got blamed for how He saved them because they thought that after that they would become automatons or robots that just automatically did good, and did the right thing, and didn't have to learn how to have victory and learn how to walk in the Spirit and learn to be dependent on the Spirit of God and so forth. And it was a misdirection. It was a doctrinal problem. And to be quite honest with you, it's wicked. It's wicked. Many preachers like to get notches on their Bible. Maybe they keep a little record of each person they've led to the Lord and they cross you know, four down and cross a hatch through it to get five and they add them up and they're keeping their trophies because they're afraid God won't remember when they get to heaven or something like that. And uh, you know, they're counting souls and they like to recount souls. There are entire camps of evangelists, quote, that evangelize the saved instead of evangelizing the lost. You know... <laughs> okay. Uh... <laughs> no, better not. No, better not. Oh, no, I, I should. No. It's Satan over there <laughs> talking to me. <laughs> no, but there are individuals um, that through evangelistic ministry harvest the saved. You bring them your Christian youth group and they preach about sanctification issues and then draw the conclusion by saying if you have trouble with sanctification, you're probably not saved. And then they evangelize the saved. And those kids get saved. But the thing they don't do that irritates me is they need to cross them off the year before if they're going to count them the year before if they're going to add them the next year. 
If it's the same kid that gets saved every year, you can't count him. The only last one ought to count. It's unfair evangelism, unfair numbers. We had this many saved. One time I took my youth group to a, a camp, and I had dealt with my kids about assurance of salvation ahead of time, and the dirty rascal that preached to them convinced them they were lost. In spite of the truth of God's Word, convinced half of me. He told me one night, I had 16 kids. I think it was 16 or 17 kids. He said, Brother, 80 of your kids got saved now. I said, I highly doubt it. I don't think so. And it wasn't because I questioned their salvation. I questioned when they got saved because those kids had gotten saved before. You say, Pastor, you think anybody ever fakes it? They know it and God knows it. And that's, and that's all there is to it. If you don't want to be saved and you pray to get preacher to leave you alone, or you pray to get mom and dad off your back, or you pray to keep from getting spanked, whatever your motive is, you know that. You know I want to go to hell. I don't want to be God's enemy, but I'm going to pray this to get these people to leave me alone. You know if you're praying for a person or praying because you want to be born again. Right? That's not mysterious. And so that's just a fact as well. Okay, I went off on that to tell you that this passage gives us a good angle or a good perspective. Here we have, last week we saw in the transition of King Saul, we saw that not only had Saul been rejected for his first rebellion against God, he was rejected from having his seed on the throne forever. Remember that? God would have caused his seed to sit on the throne forever. And for all the Calvinists that believe that everything is predestinated and meant to be, and you don't take predestinated to be conformed to the image of Christ, but you make predestined to be born again or lost or predestinated to be king or to fail or to whatever, you just have a trouble with what God told Saul. Because God told him, if you hadn't done that, then I would have caused your seed to sit on the throne forever. But what you did affected what I do in response to you. And then Saul's second rebellion, which was God called, like he said, it's as a sin of witchcraft and refusing to do things God's way. Uh, last week we saw, uh, we saw that, and at that point God said, Saul, you're done being king. Not only are your kids not going to get to be king, but I'm done with you being king. And Saul's response, remember, he grabbed a hold of Samuel, ripped his garment, and Samuel turned around. What, Samuel, man, you, ever, you know, Samuel's kind of a bad dude. Brother John mentioned, was this you mentioned this last week when he, when he whacked him up at the... Somebody said, well, you know, he chopped those people up. That's kind of scary. Oh, his brother Matt. He said, Pastor, why don't you read the rest where Samuel whacked up the... Uh, I said, well, we had kids here. I can't talk about chopping people up in front of children. I can't do that. Oh, I did it. Uh, <laughs> anyway, but Samuel's kind of a bad dude. And then he comes to town. Uh, he comes to town to offer a sacrifice here in Bethlehem of Judah. And they're like, comest thou in peace? You notice that about Samuel? Like, oh no, Samuel's here. And I'm just thinking, this guy's the priest. But he's a skinner. I mean, he can, he can fillet a critter and, or a person. And it seems like Samuel, you know, when Saul grabbed a hold of Samuel, Samuel turned around and gave him the look. And I think Saul stepped back. And Saul said, you know, honor, just honor me now in front of the people. But Samuel didn't do that because Saul threatened him. And now Samuel is saying, well, you know, if Saul finds out that I'm going to anoint another king, he'll have me killed. So we realize Saul's attitude is, God's rejected me, but I'm going to try to keep the, I'm try, going to try to keep the throne anyway. Later on, you read his response to Jonathan about David, and his response is, he's going to take your throne. And he thinks that even though God has told him that his th he's been rejected from being king, and though his children have been rejected from being king, somehow he can thwart God's will. And he's got some pretty terrible audacity at this time. So Samuel's come to Bethlehem, and the elders, of, uh, the elders asked him, did you come peaceably? And he said, oh, peaceably, I came to offer sacrifice. And he said, consecrate Jesse and his sons, and you, you guys come to the sacrifice. And so Jesse and his sons come to the sacrifice, except they don't. Because Jesse doesn't bother having one of the sons come. You know the story, don't you? But I just want to look at verse 7 this evening. I'll look at verse 7 and I just want to, uh, us to notice something that I think ought to liberate us from having to know things that perhaps we cannot possibly know. You ever thought about, man, what if I'm wrong about somebody? What if they're fake? What if I'm wrong about that person and, and they turn out to be a fraud? What if I'm wrong? 
And this passage of Scripture is a real help with that because, first of all, when uh, we'll look at verse 6. It came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. Samuel looked at Eliab and he's walking up and he's ready for the sacrifice and he's been consecrated. And Samuel said, That is surely the guy. That is surely the guy. It's just so notable to realize that oftentimes we think we're wrong in thinking, uh, we think we're wrong in thinking people are good when they're really bad, but oftentimes we think people are, well, I, I said that the wrong way, we think people are, uh, oftentimes we think people are bad when they're good and vice versa, we get it wrong. And now the Bible here isn't saying Eliab's a terrible fellow, but you do see his response to David when David comes out to fight Goliath, don't you? And definitely Saul was wrong. I mean, Samuel was wrong about him, wasn't he? But you know, Eliab just looked good. Chris, you remember this. Lost people look good. Some lost people look good. There are lost people. You go downtown Fort Lauderdale on a business day, you'll see people walk around in suits and look like they're going to church. Remember some years ago, a fellow from Colorado, and I didn't know him from Adam at the time, I didn't know him from Eliab either, and he came to church when we were over on US 1 on the second floor, and he said, or he came to church, and he and his wife, and he was dressed really sharp, he dressed very professionally, and when he left, I introduced myself to him, but I just asked him, I said, when were you born again, when were you saved? Later on, I got a long letter in the mail and he wrote a big check to our church. He wrote a big check to our church and he read a long letter. And he said, you know something? He said, people don't ever ask me if I'm saved. He was saved. But he said, it occurred to me that I could go into most churches based on the way I normally dress and they'd all assume because of the way I look and act that I'm a Christian. And I could be so lost that I'd split hell wide open. He didn't say it that way, but that's essentially what he said. And he said, I really appreciate that in spite of how I looked, you asked me if I was saved. You know, we just assume if people look good that they're saved, and we assume if they look a certain way that they're not saved. And you know, the thing is, is that's just not something to make an assumption about, is it? How do you find out if somebody's saved or lost? You ask them. Ask Well, how can you be saved and have a tattoo like that? How can you be saved and wear long hair like that? I don't see how you could be saved. I heard it, my friend. I saw you smoking cigarettes in your car before church. How could you be saved and smoke cigarettes like that? How could you be so fat and be saved? How could you... I've heard uh, that <laughs> Well, it's just, you know, I've, I've heard them. I've heard them. And everybody picks the vice that they wouldn't, you know, and believes nobody could be saved if that's the vice somebody does. You know, he's got earrings all over him, man. He's got piercings everywhere. I don't know how he could be saved. Man, I'll tell you what, he just doesn't have any personality. I heard that before. I heard one time because a guy wasn't smiling that he needed to get saved. <laughs> Believe it. You know how you could know if somebody's saved or not? You can ask them and then you can believe them. But that's about it. That's about it. So the answer, do you know how you can know if somebody's saved or not? If they want to fool you, you can't. That's how. You're not that smart. And if you think you're that smart, you'll never believe me. So just go on thinking it. If you think you're so smart, no one can ever trick you or fool you. You think you're pretty smart. And I hate to tell you, but you're not, and you won't believe me anyway, so I don't need to tell you. God told Samuel something right after this first one. He said to Samuel, look at verse 7, The Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. Okay, let's stop there. 
God said about Eliab, I have refused him. And it is evident that Samuel thought that God had received him or God was going to use him for two things. You see what Samuel sees. He's got a good countenance. He's probably good looking. He probably has a good attitude. That's what really makes the countenance, isn't it? He's probably good looking. He's got a good attitude. And the other thing, think on this, he's probably fairly tall. You know, how are you going to replace Saul with a short guy? He's head and shoulders above everybody else. And I'm looking for his replacement. And I mean, God picked the head and shoulders taller guy. So that's evidently what a king looks like is he's tall. And so here comes Eliab and it's like, eh, he's pretty tall. And he looks, he's a good looking guy. He could be king. And God said, man looketh on the outward appearance. Now keep in mind here that the Scripture doesn't say, you ever heard someone say, don't look on the outward appearance? You ever heard somebody say that? Well, the Bible doesn't say that. It doesn't say, don't look on somebody's appearance. <laughs> That's nonsense. We do, don't we? You judge me every time you see me. And I'm about the only person who doesn't judge people, so I don't judge you. <laughs> but uh, the fact is, is that you know, when you see someone, you assume things about them, don't they? Don't you? That guy that called me a golfer last week judged me. He was in Sweet Tomatoes with Brother Al. And a guy says, are you a pro golfer? And I said, no, why do you say that? He said, you look like a pro golfer. How do I look like a pro golfer? He said, well, you're wearing a golf shirt. You got the physique of a golfer. I thought he didn't look very carefully. <laughs> <laughs> and there's some chubby golfers, I guess. But he said I look like a golfer. Why? I was probably the average height of a golfer, and I had a golf shirt on. And I guess I have the physique of a. Thank you. I guess a pro golfer, folks, not an amateur golfer. I have the physique of a professional golfer. Golfer. Go for it. <laughs> Thanks, Brother John. Remember that. <laughs> he judged me, didn't he? Because of what he thought I looked like. You know, you do that all the time. Why does everybody ask the tall guy if he plays basketball? Why don't you see a guy that's like the shortest guy you ever seen and be like, man, I'll bet you could steal the ball from the tallest guy easy. You remember Muggsy? Mm -hmm. Man, that little dude was the you'd think he can't play defense because you know you got the the, the guy that's uh, uh, the diminished fellow that's in the league right now playing for the Denver Nuggets Isaiah Thomas little fellow claims to be five nine he's like five four or something and a uh, little short guy and he, he can't they hide him on defense that's it. well he doesn't play anymore they don't they don't they hide him on the bench now but uh, in in Boston they hit him on defense because he couldn't play defense but uh, Muggsy could. He would pick you up when you put when you pass the ball in, he, and he would just harass the ball hitter because he could run between your legs and take the ball. He could come out, he'd come ripping around behind you. And he, I mean, you just he was so quick and he you know he could reach. Why don't you ask the short guys? You're five foot four. I'll bet you'd be a pro basketball player. Are you a basketball player? You're short. No, we'd say that about tall people, don't we? Every tall person, if you get to be like <clears throat> six four, six five, hey man, you play basketball. Why? Well, because we judge the outward appearance. That's why. That's what we do. See a guy that looks like me. You enjoy buffets, don't you? <laughs> now it's cereal, man. <laughs> just cereal. <laughs> uh, salad, you know, soup and salad. Just it's it's my weakness. Uh, <laughs> we judge people, and it's what we do. That's what God said. God said men judge people on the outward appearance and it's what they do. And he said God doesn't judge people on the outward appearance. He doesn't see the outward appearance. It's not, he ignores it. But he seeth not as man seeth. Man looketh on the outward appearance, but God, the Lord looketh on the heart. And friend, God is very kindly saying you can see what you can see. Now are there signs of rebellion in a person? There's bumper stickers you could put on your car that would show you a little bit about your heart. Right? There are places you'd go that'd show me about your heart. 
there are things you could do that would just give me, they would give me an idea, not whether you're saved or lost, but just about your spiritual condition, right? That would be true, wouldn't it? You got a guy that's always angry and yelling and cursing at people and, he, and he's, he's a believer. Well, I can see that there's things that are in the heart that shouldn't be there. In other words, what you do is a result of what's inside you. I understand that. But the Bible does not say a person's lost because of what he does. Person, Bible says a person is saved because of looking to Jesus. And God said to Samuel, though, He said the Lord sees the heart. Now don't take this and create a silly response where you go the opposite or get imbalance. No doctrine, no Bible doctrine is intended for imbalance. Doesn't matter what I do because God sees the heart. Well, that's precisely why it does matter what you do. It's because God sees the heart. Right? Uh, you know, I mean, he's, he, he, I know that's what He does, but He's got a really good heart. Well, God may know that, but you don't. You see. And I used to tease people. I think I'll get back to it sometime soon. Whenever somebody tell me he's got a really good heart, I'd be like, what's it look like? Big one or small one? What do you think the, the uh, what do you think the rhythm's like? What kind of a uh, heartbeat do they have? What kind of rate is it? High or low blood pressure? Any weaknesses in any of the valves? Now we're talking about the organ. Of course, God's talking about that center of a man's being, his affections. The fact of the matter is that by a man's heart, if you believe what you can see, you can see some things, but the truth of the matter is God's the only one that really knows the heart. You could come to church and you could be analytical and you could look at what pastor preaches and you could watch what other believers do and you could imitate good behavior. And you could look like you have a really good heart. You know, Jesus rebuked the Pharisees for that, didn't He? He talked about what they were look, what they were like on the outside. He said, you're like whited sepulchers. You're all pretty. You're all painted up nice on the outside. But He said, inwardly, He said, you're full of dead men's bones. And this evening, in conclusion, can I remind you that it really doesn't matter what anybody here thinks about you? And I'm not saying you shouldn't care about other people. You don't want to offend people. Uh, you, you need to care about what people think. But what I'm saying is as far as what you are is concerned, it doesn't matter what anybody thinks about you, but it ought to matter everything what God thinks about you because that's what you actually are. You know the reverse is often true. We oftentimes look up to men so much that we look down to God. We oftentimes look up to men so much that we look down at God. And we'll do more to please a person than we will to please God. You'll look up to somebody and you'll see them overtaken in a fault. And you wouldn't dream of saying a word to them because you look up to them so much. And yet God's Word and what the Bible says you ought to do in order to do right by them says you ought to look up to God. And you look up to them too much to say anything or to rebuke them. I hate to say it, but... There are a lot of Baptist churches that are full of people that are loyal to men and they are blind to godlessness because they look down at God and up to men. And what we just need to remember is that God sees the heart. God sees the heart. God knows what it is. Now what if you say, Pastor, you're a pastor. You're supposed to help people spiritually. What if there's something in somebody's heart and you need to deal with it. God tells me. God tells me what I need to know. I'm amazed sometimes how God tells me things. Or God sometimes shows me. He tells me things or He shows me things. I'm not suspicious at all. And I'll casually say something that doesn't mean anything at all what people think it means, and it shows me something. Well, why'd you ask me that? Well, now I'm kind of wondering why I asked you that, actually. Because all I meant by it was, well, is that all you meant by that? 
Well, why are you suspicious of what I meant? What are you hiding? Or, what are you doing here? Why would you come here? How <laughs> many times Holy Spirit just prompted me to visit somebody? Why would you come here? What are you doing here? Who sent you? What did they tell you? Holy Spirit shows you things, or God, Holy Spirit uh, tells you things. Sometimes I just tell you something's, something's not right. You know what He's never showed me though? He's never showed me that a person who says he's saved is lost. He's never showed me that. I know you say you're saved, but God told me you're lost. I've heard people say things like that. God just doesn't do that. God wants to show a lost person that they're lost. He'll show them. And they'll tell you about it. I don't think this is a secret at all. Um, Brother Rob, Rob Redland was with us a few weeks ago, and he, he's a church planter, and so he came to see the church plant in Miami Beach. And he, he was interim pastoring, and he said one of the unique things in the short time he was interim pastor was that a deacon said, Pastor, I need to talk to you. And essentially the deacon had told him, you know, I've lived an exemplary life. I'm a deacon in this church. And... He'd raised his kids well. His, 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 he had a good family. He was an example to the believers in the church, but he said, I, I'm not saved. I've never been saved. I don't know how he got to be deacon of the church, but he said, I'm not saved, and I've never been saved. And then he got, he got saved. He got saved. Now, what a time of rejoicing that is. And then uh, Brother Rob said, but you're not a deacon anymore, you know. You're not supposed to be a novice and be a deacon. And new believers, many he's, he's not grown yet. He may know a lot of behaviors, but you know the guy convinced everybody he was saved. And no one would have believed it if you told him he was lost, but God knew it and he knew it, and God showed him and that's how everybody else knows. Because that's how God does it. Mind your own business. That's not a rude statement. It's an accurate statement. Mind your own business. Stop trying to know something only God can know. God's not going to tell you. It's His business. He's the one that looks on the heart. You're the one that looks on the outward. So you go around and judge people's outward appearance. Okay? But let God judge the heart. You're going to judge people's appearance. That's why appearance matters. You never hear me say, it doesn't matter how you look. It doesn't matter what you do. Well, it does. It does, but it has nothing to do with whether or not a person's saved. Only God knows that. You hear me this evening? So you're going to do what people do. Say, well, you shouldn't look at how people are dressed. People do. All right, you've heard this one before, and I'll tire you with it again. Melissa and I visited a church some years ago, and every person I met there because I was wearing a sport coat told me that they didn't wear a sport coat on Wednesday night. Come in, the ushers or greeters. Oh, hey, nice to meet you. Oh, we don't wear sport coats on Wednesday nights. Well, if they wanted me to defrock right there, you know, I'll take my... What do you... Come in, meet people. Oh, we don't wear... Every person, every man I met there told me they didn't wear sport coats on Wednesday nights. I guess it's forbidden in their church constitution or something. I don't know. <laughs> the pastor told me we don't wear sport coats on Wednesday nights or we don't wear suit coats on Wednesday nights. We don't wear... We, we dress down on Wednesday nights. We don't, we don't wear suit coats here. And I felt like I should be able to come to church and if I want to wear a suit coat, I shouldn't be made to feel uncomfortable. Nobody should judge me. Don't you think so? Yeah. And you know something? If I ever go to that church again on Wednesday night, you know I'm going to wear? I'm going to wear a sport coat. Not because I always wear a sport coat on Wednesday nights, because I'm going to wear what I want to when I go to that church and they can think whatever they want about me. <laughs> That's a rebel in me, isn't it? You know, it kind of does matter what you wear because people think things. I always thought that, that was kind of silly, but it was really a good illustration for me that people look on the outward appearance. They do. They judge the outward appearance. You can't hide it if you come into this church and you're a preacher. It's pretty tough. A lot of times a guy will come, he'll show up, and right when he's putting his breath man in before he shakes my hand, I'll say, so where are you, pastor? 
I don't know why that's a preacher motion, but the classic the guys, the guys that are just under baby boomer age and, and older, they all put a breath mint in before they shake your hand. A lot of times, I've just noticed that. And when they put that breath mint in their mouth, I judge them. I think you're a preacher. So where are you pastor at? I always get it. Oh yeah, how'd you know I was a pastor? Breath mint. <laughs> You see, preachers are warped <laughs> people. I can just I can spot one. I can spot a preacher pretty well. You can show up in disguise and I can usually spot you. You know, you don't have your sport coat on, but I can tell from the way you comb your hair. I can just tell from the way you sit down and the way you put your Bible down. I can just I can spot a preacher. I'm being silly at this point. But friend, we look on the outward appearance and God said that's what you do. And so our outward appearance does matter, doesn't it? You look like a fornicator, that's a problem. You look like a drug addict, that's a problem. You look like, a, like you're into pop culture too much and that's a problem. You see, because you're representing the wrong way and man judges the outward appearance. Lost people do, saved people do, people judge people as whole. You're not supposed to judge thing. Well, go ahead and hold somebody to that standard, but find me a person who doesn't judge. Because everybody does. But what we judge is not the heart. We judge the outward appearance. So mind your own business. Mind your own business, okay? I hope that's helpful. Is that impolite to say mind your own business? Okay, anybody here offended by it? Dare you. Dare you tell me you're offended by it. I'll publicly apologize and I'll cry. I'll just say it, taking care of business. Taking care of business? All right. Thank you, brother. That's pop culture, isn't it? I just judged you. <laughs> Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you tonight for the truth of the Scripture. I pray that you just help it to ring through our ears that the Lord seeth not as man seeth. And God, I pray that you would help us to understand that when it comes to the things of the heart, we can't see them. And that to pretend that we can, that God is something that we're, we don't have permission for, and it's not our business. Help us to remember that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed. That was his motto, taking care of business. Okay. I thought that was his song. No.